to become a really good pain in the ass How to become a really good pain in the ass This Canadian's a right question repository He's like a pleasant skeptical suppository That's right, how to be a really good pain in the ass. Please welcome Christopher DiCarlo. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be invited down here. Um, I want to thank uh, DJ and, and James Randi and everybody else uh, who was involved in uh, having me come down. And um, it's been a, a wonderful conference uh, so far. I've met a lot of interesting people and and hope to talk to you, uh, some of you, after, after my talk today, which is, as you just heard, about uh, how to become a really good pain in the ass. So what, uh, what I've done is I've basically written a book for uh, critical thinking based on the idea of asking questions that irk people to get them to think more clearly about why it is they believe what they do and why it is they behave the way they do. So. It's really named after Socrates and the ancient skeptics because they were extremely good at asking people these questions. Socrates likened himself to a gadfly or today like a mosquito, something that would, would bother people and, and whatnot. And, and I just figured today we would call such a person you know, a pain in the ass. But Socrates and the ancient skeptics, they were really good at what they did. So hence, that's why we, we have that particular title. It's based on how people respond to five important questions, really important questions, um, so important that I call them the big five. And these are the questions that humans have evolved to ask themselves through the evolution of language and consciousness, and they, they basically run like this. What are the limits of my knowledge? What can I know? Why am I here? What am I? How should I behave? And what is to come of me? And yesterday, you might remember, Lawrence said, it's not why. We shouldn't be asking, you know, you hear why questions. You hear this from, from kids all the time. Why, 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 you know? And, and Louis C.K. says, you know, just shut up and eat your French fries, right? But, so I've asked a lot of different questions, you know, the what's, the why's, and the how's. And I find them to be extremely important because how we answer these questions really tells us a great deal about ourselves and it tells us a great deal about other people as well. So, you know, when I look on television I see things like, you know, speed dating, the phenomenon of speed dating and how, you know, people get together and determine whether or not they want to uh, continue on to have another date or that sort of thing. I guarantee you, you ask any person, any or all of those five questions, you will immediately know an awful lot about what makes them tick, who they are, what they believe, and potentially how they behave, how they act. And the way in which we answer these questions tends to have a kind of trickle-down effect, you know, about other really, really important questions, things like, you know, abortion and euthanasia and human rights and, you know, crime and punishment, healthcare, law, and even art. So they are very powerful questions and they do tell us an awful lot about, about who we are. And over this weekend I've been watching and listening to a lot of people speak. And we consider ourselves skeptics. And I, I, I was thinking, what is it about skepticism in particular? Why do we do what we do? And it really comes down to ways of looking at the world and the way in which people answer questions and go about thinking about things. And it can bother us to a certain extent in the way in which people answer those questions because how you answer them can affect your behavior and that behavior can harm others. And so skepticism is really about looking at the ways in which people see the world and then pointing out aspects or shortcomings or inconsistencies and contradictions so that essentially it's, it's, it's a knowledge-based but also a compassion-based enterprise. It's a way of, of going about living. It's a way of life. <coughs> And so I divided the book essentially into three parts. And in the first part, I call it you know, the ABCs and D, E, and Fs of, of critical thinking. And I mean that literally. So we have A is for argument, B is for bias, C is for context, D is for diagramming, E is for evidence, and F is for fallacies. And in part one, 
you, you basically get the, the tools of the trade, so to speak. These are what are going to make you better thinkers and, and reflect you know, in, in more responsible ways about, about what we believe and why we believe that. In part two, I look at Socrates and the ancient skeptics because I really do think they are you know, the best damn pains in the ass in, in history. And I take a, a look at the Socratic method. Many of you will already know what that is, but it's an interesting way in which to have a discussion with somebody. And that is you, you can basically be engaged with a person and get them to talk more and more about what it is they believe, what they do. Socrates would feign ignorance. And he made a distinction between blind ignorance and reflective ignorance. And we heard Stewart's paper about ignorance and scientific ignorance and whatnot. And I'm fascinated with this subject because I'm, I'm a philosopher of science. And I will tell you right now that yes, Lawrence Krauss and I do kind of uh, have a, a, a friendly uh, battle. He's not a huge fan of philosophers. But uh, you might have heard in his talk yesterday, he said, some of them are OK. So <laughs> he did look at me when he said that. So I'm going to, to accept that, that he's kind of coming on board. Now, this technique is used very effectively in The Daily Show and The Colbert Report. And if any of you are fans of those shows, you'll know that instead of being immediately adversarial, many of the reporters will agree with the person they're interviewing to demonstrate how ludicrous what, what it is they believe and what it is they're saying. It's a very effective approach. And of course, when I look at the skeptics, they developed a wonderful method known as the modes to show a systematic demonstration of how people don't really have answers to the big five or other questions of that importance at what I call an absolute or big T level of truth. Now, in, in part three, I basically just look at all of the, the big five questions again, but I look at the way in which people answer these questions on a natural level and a supernatural level and show the differences between the two. Some people try to, try to connect them, try to hybridize the natural with the supernatural. So I just look at the scientific way, or the way science answers the big five, and then I look at the way su uh, supernaturalists answer the big five. And then I ask, essentially, the reader, where do you fit, and why do you fit in, into these, these particular ways of answering these questions? Today, I'm going to look at question one, because as skeptics, you know, we want to know, what are the limits of our knowledge? What do we know, and what can we say? So. I'll look a bit at, at uh, Socrates, but more, more specifically at the ancient skeptics. So to begin, <laughs> in case you didn't know, Dick Cheney was apparently a robot or is apparently a robot. This would certainly explain an awful lot. Uh, Bigfoot kept a lumberjack as a love slave. I uh, have him photographed by the Hubble telescope, but somebody get Lawrence Krauss back in here very quickly. He's, he's going to want to <laughs> want to know this. And, and sadly, of course, the final issue of Weekly World News, right? Yes, I know. <laughs> now, we look at these things, right? And we ask, what, why would anybody believe these things, right? Or, or similar stories, right? And when we do, we, we make an assumption that there are really better and worse ways to interpret and to act on them. And the term is called epistemic responsibility. And that means how responsible were we in gathering information that we call knowledge and then acting on that, that information. So we essentially doubt their truth. Why? Because they're inconsistent, right, with the logical structure and methods and means for explaining you know, events and, and cause and effect relationships in the world. And so we have reservation about these things, sometimes disdain for them, and we have good reason to doubt them. We are, of course, skeptical of their truth. Now, it's important to ask ourselves what it means to be skeptical today by tracing its rich ancestry. So the theme of 10. 10 is the future of skepticism, and I thought when I was asked, what better topic to, to discuss today than to look back at the roots of skepticism to see how we got to where we are now, which might give us a better way of understanding what's going to happen in the future. And when we have this understanding, uh, we'll see a basic, clear, obvious path, a connection between the evolution of, of scientific reasoning as well. So there's a definite path of skeptical reasoning and thinking and scientific investigation. Now, as many of you will probably already know, the Greek term uh, skeptikos uh, literally means inquirer or investigator. So 
I'm going to go old school on you now, and I'm going to go right back to some of the first recorded historical figures. So Piero of Elis, what was known as Pyrrhonism, was the founder of this, this first school of, of uh, a skepticism around 360 BCE. And he basically said, we have to ask ourselves three questions about the world. What is the stuff of things? What do people think reality actually is? In what relation do we stand to things around us? Here we have one of the first uh, recorded instances in history of, an, of a human demonstrating that we affect or can affect what it is we're, we're observing. And then what is the result as far as our happiness is concerned with this kind of metaphysical you know, detachment? So what he did was he basically looked out into the world and he saw a lot of people bickering about what reality actually was. And here's what he came up with. He said, you know what? I don't know, but neither do any of you. You don't know what reality is. You might think you do, but you don't. So he shrugged his shoulders. And in Greek, this is, this is a term called epokes, to suspend, suspend belief. And instead of being ridden with this kind of existential angst of not knowing what reality actually is, he found that he was relieved. He found that he was kind of in a state of, of, of tranquility because he wasn't burdened by having to try to figure all, you know, what absolute reality actually was. And so he abstained from fanaticism concerning these types of things, and he lived in a kind of contented and, and peaceful way, um, basically not claiming to know what is absolutely true or false about the true nature of reality. He exercised moderation in the face of massive uh, unyielding forces of nature, things like death and illness that everyone must face. This is a Greek term known as metriopatia, and it means we can control our passions when confronted with natural forces that are really beyond our control. And he used an example, an analogy, it's known as Pyrrho's pig. And the story goes like this. He was at sea on a ship during a, a tumultuous storm, a very, you know, a, a wild tempest. And uh, people were panicking and they didn't know what was going to happen. And Pyrrho apparently was sitting fairly calmly. And people were coming up to him saying, what is wrong with you? Don't you realize we could die? Don't you realize what's going on? And he apparently pointed to this, this pig that was eating its slop in the, in the stall. And he said, it's totally unaware of what's going on, but it's hungry, so it's going to eat. I don't know what's going to happen, but you think I'm going to act like you? Are you making the situation better by acting in this way? So it demonstrates the capacity to recognize when we have control and when we do not have control within specific natural instances or circumstances. Uh, today we might uh, consider another popular figure using this, this particular method. Right. So, in times of crises, it would be favorable to have cool-headed, clear thinkers who can act accordingly. And so, in this way, a skeptic is always made. They're never born. It takes considerable time and it takes a lot of discipline to be able to recognize and accept one's ignorance and their constraints. Uh, I think this guy said it best in Dirty Harry. A man's got to know his limitations, or a person has to know their limitations, and I'm referring to epistemic limitations. Now, the academic skeptics lived at the time Plato, so we had the, the pre-academics with Pyrrho, and the academic skeptics, they made this wonderful distinction between reality, like appearance and reality, and they separated metaphysical matters, you know, those which really cannot be resolved or or, or figured out in any kind of rational or empirical way. And they separated these from the common sense, you know, practical matters, those that we have to deal with on a day to day, uh, day in, day out basis on a practical level. So there's a similarity between this type of approach and the eventual development of modern science. Science, we know, is generally pragmatic, which means, you know, if it works and it's communally agreeable, then it's provisionally warranted and it's accepted. So scientists are generally not in the metaphysical business. One of the superstars of the, the academic uh, skeptic period was, was a gentleman named Arcesilaus of Patane. And he said, knowledge of the inner nature of things is not possible without determining first absolute criteria by which to make such determinations. And this is extremely important because the problem of establishing a criterion or a set of criteria which can justify metaphysical beliefs, 
This notion has been around for millennia, and it's really the type of thing we, we can demand of those who make these types of claims. But people often conveniently forget or ignore this. I'm a Canadian, and when I come, I come to this country, I see bumper stickers, I see all kinds of billboards and whatnot, you know, God bless America. And to say that is, is to assume that such a being actually exists. I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of naive, I assume it means Allah. I'm not, I'm not sure um, which God they're referring to, or Quetzalcoatl, I'm not sure, but to say that is, is fairly audacious. It's to say, I have absolute information of the very reality of our experiences. There no, could be nothing higher than this. This can also lead to lazy and unwarranted thinking for other factors, and it can have considerable influence on pseudoscientific thinking, mysticism, paranormal activity, and, and other aspects. So what, what the skeptics find is that we're humbled by acknowledging that we're limited in our knowledge. Once we make this realization, we can get on with matters which affect us more directly, <coughs> such as common sense, practical affairs, and of course, eventually scientific investigations. Epistemic humility, when it's attained in this manner, is really a responsible starting point in the acquisition of information. Being ignorant in this way, we have to get the message out, is not such a bad thing. It's actually a liberating thing. It makes us all equal. We're all on the same level playing field. So this type of humility is egalitarian. Reflecting on this ignorance in this way is a responsible manner. It applies to every person on this planet and it cuts through any and all barriers, whether they're naturally evolved or culturally created. This is the great equalizer, our capacity to reflect on our ignorance of what is absolutely real. And it's the reason why is many people find it difficult to say, you know, I don't know. And, and this gets taught in schools to some degree, from K to 12 and through college and, and so on and so forth, where you're rewarded for having the so-called right answer and, and you don't begin at a basis of ignorance, which maintains that it's okay, you're at the same starting point as everyone else. So one of the greatest legacies, I think, the ancient skeptics have given us is this understanding of this kind of overall epistemic framework in which we attempt to understand the world and our place in it. One of our species' greatest cultural and conceptual accomplishments is really the separation of big T metaphysical truth from what I call little t or common sense and scientific truth. And I think we have, to, we have a, an obligation personally as a professor and an educator to get the message out that it's okay if you don't have big T truth, that nothing really changes. And I get a thought experiment, I give a thought experiment to kids sometimes in my classes, I say, let's just assume, okay, that your understanding of big T truth when you answer you know, those five questions is really not the case. What does it really change? You're still here, you still have to get along with everybody, you still enjoy certain aspects of life and avoid other aspects. So it's, it's, it's a, an exercise or a, or a thought experiment I try to get students to consider in, in classes. Now with the post-academic skeptics, we have Anasodemus, and, and a gentleman named Sextus Empiricus. And what they found is that when it comes to trying to figure out what, what is real, what is not real, and so on, they acquiesce to the appearances. And they live according to what they called a four-stage practical criterion. I would recommend any of you to find anywhere, online or, or, or anywhere else, outlines of Pyrrhonism. It's literally the basis of all skepticism. What, what Sextus Empiricus did is he took all of the information from all of the centuries of skepticism and put them into a four volume work. And uh, if, if you really want to know about the history of skepticism, Outlines of Pyrrhonism is it. And the four stage practical criterion, look at how commonsensical it is. They live according to the guidance of nature. You know, things like gravity, try not to put your hand into a flame for too long. Um, you know, I, if you don't believe in, 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 in the effects of gravity, then just flap your arms and fly around this room, right? You will learn very quickly that, in fact, it works. The second criterion is the constraint of bodily drives. 
we have to eat and sleep and go to the washroom and, and have sex and so on and so forth. These are just facts of, of nature. The tradition of laws and customs are to have rules. If you've ever lived with the roommate from hell, you know that without rules, people can basically do whatever they want. So we get together and we establish agreed upon ways of, of living and they call it instruction in the arts or essentially to do something, to ha get a job, to do something you're good at, preferably. Skepticism requires this kind of common sense acceptance of an environment in which we develop concepts, ideas, behaviors. And this is known, that the technical term is hypothetical realism. In other words, things like people, animals, plant stars, galaxies, these things actually exist, right? In common sense terms, we just call this the world or, or the universe. And they exist separate from our thinking of them. Otherwise, we would just be a big collective room full of solipsis. Right? Unless future evidence warrants concern, a good skeptic treats these things as though they exist separately from our thinking about them. So at the common sense level, and then eventually in greater detail at the scientific level. But if there's no absolute criterion no set of, of criteria, no reality measuring stick whatsoever, and we can't establish absolute certainty, then how do we distinguish good ideas from bad ones? What is our measuring stick at this small t level of truth? Well, if we look at something called historical facticity, this basically means that we are sort of locked in, as it were, to our usage of mathematics, logic, uh, scientific reasoning, ethical reasoning, at this particular period of time in 2012. In other words, Aristotle couldn't have discussed gene therapy, uh, Newton could not have discussed downloading information off the internet, and right now we can't discuss ways in which future generations are going to describe aspects of their world as well. So this context that we are in right now of historical facticity, we use the tools that are best available to us right now. Yes, information might change about how we understand the world in the future, but this is what we're doing right now. So scientific knowledge is gradual, it's cumulative. We see as far today because we're essentially standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Of those who did the hard work before us and we continue on with that effort. The measuring sticks we use today to distinguish idea, good ideas from bad ones basically have specific criteria. This is what determines what makes an idea for us a good one or a bad one. They adhere to criteria like consistency. You don't want to leave a speaker's talk and say how much you admired the inconsistency of that talk. You would rarely do that. So we do value criteria of consistency, parsimony or simplicity where it applies, non-contradiction and the prediction of novelty. We've established and agreed upon rules which are impartial and fair to all. Uh, why? We try to establish universality. So when we conduct experiments here, we hope that they can be conducted in similar manners regardless of where they're done throughout the world. And as skeptics, we have an obligation to continue to establish universal rules of reasoning in an effort to hold people accountable, not only for their beliefs through epistemic <coughs> responsibility, but more importantly, for their actions which may be harmful to other humans or other species. In this way, we become useful and really good pains in the ass. Skeptics today owe a great deal of thanks to a great tradition of ancient thought. One of the driving principles of all modern skeptics and scientists today resonates from the collective works of the ancient skeptics. Think responsibly, act accordingly. Thank you. Thank you.